session is on time series. Uh, um, there are very little coding or programming part in, in this session uh, because uh, especially for time series, it's a quite a well-known problem in the field. So if you Google uh, time series uh, things, right, there will actually there, there will be a lot of uh, sample programs on time series uh, that, that operate on different data sets. Yeah, so for the programming part, you can, I think you can quite easily Google. Uh, what we'll cover today is more of the concepts behind things. So yeah. Uh, more more on the what are time series and what are the intuition behind some of the more common models. So the more the more common models are autoregressive, uh, moving the average, and then ARMA Arena. So ARMA actually is a combination of autoregressive and moving average, as you can see from the acronym. And then we'll also talk about some more um, exotic models. So exotic here is because they are not usually used or rather or maybe they are new to the time series field but they actually share similar concepts so they are typically techniques from like different fields um, out there that would also apply to time series data yeah. okay so what is time series right um, as the name suggests it's a series so it here the word series is used to describe a sequence so basically they are a sequence of data points in successive order so the successive order tells you that it's across time uh, it can be things like how number of passengers go over the months uh, or daily closing stock price over the years or temperature over over hours so the units of the time doesn't quite matter the point is as long as it varies over time it works so there is time series. Uh, to put it a bit more formally, you can consider time series as uh, something discrete, right? So at each point in time, you have some data. So if you look at the first graph, the, the first picture, um, you have data at time one. So maybe let's say one second uh, from now, and then you have data at time equals two, and then data at time is equal three, time is equal four, and then time is equals, time equals t, right? So you have this data in successive order, and then your job, or rather the whoever is working with time series, is to make predictions, right? So you can make predictions about the future. So let's say given the past, so one, two, three, and so on, until now, somewhere here, you want to predict the next data in the sequence. So the red bar here. And although this may seem a bit not maybe not trivial, but rather a bit short, right? Like sometimes you care about things far into the future, but how come we are only predicting one time step ahead? So we're only predicting like one square ahead. Um, it's quite easy to extend this into arbitrary time frame into the future because you can just move the green box one time step to the right, and then move the right box the red box one time step to the right also. So you'll predict and then you just assume your prediction was correct and then use it to predict the, the next one. Yeah. So technically you only ever need to predict one time step into the future. If, even if you want to predict like quite far later on. I mean accuracy is a different matter, but you can make the predictions technically. So that is one way you can frame the problem of time series. Another way of uh thinking about time series is to let's say to, to consider other variables right so for things like let's say your stock it's quite unlikely for the stock price to um, to rely solely on its past price right so scenario one uh, is simple but it doesn't really explain reality right because even things like your stock price you don't normally you don't expect your stock price in the future to um, to be dependent only on past stock prices. You expect them to have some underlying information. So it could be market sentiment, uh, or it could be some other some other factors, right? So these other factors we're gonna call them A. And these other factors are likely to change over time also, and which is why A one 
uh, can become A2 at time 2 and then A3, A4 and AT, right? So the, the, the future data XT will depend on its past values as well as these hidden uh, other variables, um, A1, A2, A3. So scenario two is probably more representative of reality. The issue is that this other variable, if you have it, that's great. That means more information for you to make predictions. Um, the problem comes when this other variable is something that you cannot, uh, you cannot know. For example, things like sentiment, that may be uh, difficult to, to get uh, data for. Lah. Or th this other variable could be something quanti qualitative, and that will that'll make it very hard to, to use for prediction. So sometimes you may be forced to use the first model instead of the second model, because there are no other data that you can use. Okay, so that is uh, about, about the modeling part. So why, why is making predictions difficult, right? So in the first model, which is actually the simple one, the one that doesn't require any other variables, you already encounter some issues, right? You already encounter issues such, such as how many data points from the past would actually help in making your prediction. Because uh, if you take too much data in the past, that may skew your uh, prediction. It, your prediction may rely too much on, on data in the past, which you may not want it to be. Like. So there's, there's this idea of how, how much into the past should we even consider. Yeah, so that's point one. And point two, so far we've been assuming that um, the transformation, so your data goes from one day to another day according to some function, right? So it, it behaves quite nicely. So let's say if from today to tomorrow it'll increase, then uh, we are assuming that from tomorrow to the day after tomorrow it'll increase again. So yeah, the behavior over time stays the same. But the problem, there's another problem if the function f also changes over time. So not only does your x1 changes to x2, the, the rule as to how it changes also changes. So you can think of it as like you know, displacement velocity acceleration. So predicting displacement will be easy um, if, you, if your velocity is constant. If your car speed is constant, you can predict where the car is going to be. But the moment your velocity itself becomes not constant, then it starts to get uh, more problematic to, to be able to predict where your car is. Yeah, that's the idea here. And lastly, what if your past values don't even predict your future values? So what we drew here, the boxes and rectangles, they are a model, right? We sort of assume that uh, the future depends on the past. But if that is not even true, then there's no point in making predictions. Your prediction will always be wrong because you can't, by definition, you can't predict it. So, so these are some of the problems for the simple model. And for the more complicated one, you have all the same problems plus one more, which is what if your other variables, these A's, they are not observable. So that, that's the term here. And by observable, we just mean that you cannot assign a value to it. For example, consumer confidence. You can survey and get some values, but most of the time you won't even be able to have these numbers in the first place because you probably didn't conduct the survey. Yeah, so this is what we mean. Um, all right, we're going to ignore the problems first. We're going to assume that these problems don't exist, and then we'll slowly introduce each of the problem in and then see how we can tackle each of them. Yeah. Um, for basic time series, there are certain characteristics to consider. So there's trend, which I think is quite straightforward. Like for example, in this graph, the trend is that it's rising upwards. So yeah, you can draw a straight line up. Uh, seasonality, which corresponds to how how it oscillates over time. So if you if you look at the graph, it looks like it's going up and then down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Yeah. So that serves as the seasonality and there may be outliers 
in this graph there are not no there are no outliers or at least no obvious ones but in real world data you're gonna have like some data points maybe somewhere here like way off the trend and some other data points yeah the problem with outliers is that they tend to skew um the the prediction right because you imagine if there's one huge outlier somewhere your let's say your linear regression line it is going to get skewed towards the outlier and they'll make the linear regression not correspond to the actual trend in the data so do be careful of outliers and yeah there are in order to model time series data accurately there are a lot of assumptions that you need to have actually so and each of these assumptions actually correspond to the problems that we have mentioned right so for example things like we assume that the past affects the present and if this assumption is violated then we are pretty much screwed. like we can't we can't predict things and uh, finite k past values affect the present that means we don't have to look infinitely far into the past in order to be able to predict now so that is another useful assumption because if this assumption is violated then again our model will not be able to work because yeah there's no way you can look very far into the past um ideally your k is small so ideally you only need to look at like three days into the past five days into the past uh due to computational constraints but they can technically be as big as you want as long as they are finite assumption tree is no function changes over time so if you remember the f that changes your x1 to x2 yeah you don't want the function to change over time so you don't want the velocity to change over time because that'll make your job much harder assumption tree can technically be tackled it's just that having it as an assumption makes life much easier so it's an assumption yes but it's on a different level from your assumption one and two and assumption four is something called stationarity uh there's so this word actually has a precise definition in math and the reason why we need this assumption is for the theory behind model fitting to work but very roughly speaking stationarity you can think of it as um how the mean the average changes right so if you consider image a right this trend here so there's periodicity but if you uh, draw a, a small window so this blue box in the left and then you draw another small window a blue box at the right and then you take the mean within those two windows you co you can see that the average in in the two windows are roughly the same they have roughly the same level at least according to the y-axis so this is what we call a stationary series but if you consider the graph at the right you do the same technique so you draw one window draw another window and then take the take the average take the average you see that the averages are very different from each other so this is not stationary series um this is the the least of our worries because you can actually convert a non-stationary series into a stationary one uh the technique is called differencing uh, we'll cover it later it's a very simple technique but basically after you do your differencing most of the time you're gonna get a stationary series so that's problem solved so this is probably the weakest of the assumptions all right now actually getting into the fun part of modeling uh we'll go we'll look at auto regressive model first ar so let's say this is our data right it's a time series data it's actually tesla's closing price over time from 2020 april 2020 december so this is how it looks uh yeah so the trend it's it's an upward trend period seasonality is not not too obvious because there's no clear um, ups and downs in it that that happens frequently like at least yeah and stationarity if you if you take the window thingy it's you can see that it's not um, 
it's not a stationary series. Okay, but anyways, there are some things that we can do to this. One of the most maybe straightforward thing is to actually just apply your linear regression to this, right? Because you see that it's somewhat upward sloping, so you can hey um, draw draw a line through them. So just draw a best fit line across the graph. Then you're done. You are predicting the stock price, right? I mean, I guess that kind of works, but you are using the time to predict the price, which is a bit awkward for time for stock price, right? Because you you shouldn't be able to predict um, the stock price based on the date. I can't. You shouldn't be able to predict like eight February. What's the stock price? You know that that kind of thing. If you don't know what price is it it is now so while while you can draw a straight line and, and get some data and some prediction it's a bit strange from a modeling point of view because you are using time to straight away get price so to, to avoid this you want to use the more intuitive one which is to use past stock price to predict future stock price and this approach is called auto regressive yeah, the, the word auto here's the regressive is like regression, right? The word auto here is to regress on itself. Yeah, that's that's the idea here. So you regress on the past data to predict the future data. Uh, uh excuse me. Sorry, yes. Yeah, sorry to interrupt, but can you explain again why we can't just draw a straight line and predict it predict oh. it using time? Okay, you can, right? So you can do it, right? You can you can just draw 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 an entire state line, straight line, and that'll work. The problem is that it as a, from a modeling point of view, it doesn't quite make sense because un, unless you know what's the stock price today, you shouldn't be able to predict what is the stock price tomorrow. Does that make sense? Like the relationship is not between time and price; it's rather between uh, the past stock price and the future stock price. So you can, but it's not exactly very accurate. Does, does that make sense? Uh, so we can't just assume that time is inherently related to the stock price? Um, yeah, so if you do a straight away, if you straight away do a linear regression, then the assumption made is that time predicts price, right? Whether or not that assumption is true remains to be seen. But that is a, an approach that you can take. Okay, thank you. Yeah, right. So auto regressive is, yeah, it's another approach, but it's basically doing regression, but the the data that you're using is the past data, and then the, 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 the thing that you're predicting is the future data. So a linear regression model looks like this, right? It's um, yeah, so basically you have coefficients and then you multiply the coefficients with the data. And if you compare it to an autoregressive model, it looks almost exactly the same thing. So to explain a bit more, xt is your future, or, or rather what you want to predict. xt minus 1 is one step behind, so it could be yesterday's one. xt minus 2 would be two days ago, X, xt minus 3 would be three days ago. So when you're doing this, you're actually doing auto-regressive model. And theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 would be your parameters that you want to learn, uh, including C. Yeah, so this is what the equation is saying. Uh, the linear regression equation is on top, just as a comparison to show that um, it's actually super similar. The only difference is how do you interpret the input? So in auto-regressive model, the input is kind of like itself instead of some other variable. And because it is technically linear regression, the assumption, the implicit assumption made is that uh, you assume that the relationship is linear, right? You assume that uh, the past linearly predicts the future. So you can use a linear function. You can just multiply by theta one, theta two, theta three, right? Um, yeah, that means no squaring. You shouldn't, you shouldn't need to square past values to get future values. You shouldn't need to do some 
other strange uh, computation to get the future value, right? These assumptions, again, may not hold. So when things go wrong, when, when let's say accuracy is not too high, prediction accuracy is not too high, do keep in mind these assumptions and maybe you can like sort of change the model according to the assumptions uh, to, to see if improvements are made, right? Okay, and for an autoregressive model, there is one hyperparameter. So there's one number that you need to set manually. And this is what we call the order, right? Um, if you remember from a few slides ago, we talked about how much of the past is actually useful to predict the future. That is what order means here. So how many days into the past should we consider to predict today? So in this uh, equation drawn in the slide, we are actually setting p equals to 3. So we are saying we need to look 3 days into the past. So p minus 1, p minus 2, p minus 3. 3 days into the past. Yeah. Um, but it's important to note that the value of p doesn't mean only p past values affect the present. right? Because if you start um, doing your sliding window, so you consider 3 days ago to predict today, and then you use today's prediction to predict tomorrow, you are technically using the three days ago data also, but it has already been packaged as a prediction for today. Yeah, um, I, I'm not sure if that if that is clear, but the idea P here is that we are saying that knowing P is enough to, to predict the present. So it doesn't mean that only P were used, but rather it it's saying that if you have p, that would have been enough. The model may go and use more than p. Yeah. So that is the that is the idea behind this p number, this order. Right. Uh. Okay. Uh. Hello. Yes. Sorry. Just just to make sure, right? That means uh, -huh. uh you're saying that, for example, the order is three, right? Mm -hmm. uh, regardless, I take uh, three past days or four past days or five past days, I'll get the same result, is it? Because mm. you what? said just now, like, if order three, that means three days in the past would have been enough, is it? Uh, yeah, something, maybe, okay, maybe something like this, more like, so let, let's say you're trying to predict a few days into the future, right? So you only have three data from the past. So t minus one, t minus two, t minus three, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're using these three data to predict t. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, how would you make a prediction for t plus one? Uh, x t, x t minus one, and x two, x t minus two. Yes, correct. But because your x t was actually derived from t minus 1, t minus 2, and t minus 3. So technically, the value of t minus 3 is influencing your t plus 1. Okay. Yes, even though you set p to 3. Does that oh. make sense? Yeah, so it, 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 it doesn't mean that only uh, t, only 3 days, because in this case, you are actually your t minus 3 would actually have influenced your prediction also. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. But what we mean by sufficient here is that if your xt is an actual data point, then your problem is solved. It, it would have been enough to make the prediction. Oh, xt alone would have been enough? Uh, sorry, as in xt, xt minus 1, and xt minus 2. Oh, okay. okay, like, okay. It, yeah, if xt is an actual data and not a prediction. Okay, okay. Yeah, so that's okay, yeah, that's probably. Hopefully that's clear. Is there like a guideline for what the value of p should be? Mm, good question. Um, I think there should there's a slide somewhere in there. Um, there's a technique to actually help you determine what is p, but uh, the technique is quite complicated lah. And honestly, a for loop will probably suffice. Okay, thanks. Yeah, because auto regressive model is actually quite fast to derive. So, um, yeah, there's that. Alright, can move on. 
Uh, okay, I, I, I'm not going to go through this, right, because as you can see, it's very messy. But the idea is that there are certain um, properties in your time series that if they hold, then your autoregressive model is either redundant or useless, right? So for example, things like to, if your data satisfies what is called a Markov property, which is when your today's value depends only on yesterday, right? Then it doesn't quite matter what your P value is set to because the best model you can get is the model when P equals to one and changing your P value, your, the value of P will not get you a better result. In fact, if it gives you a better result, then that's probably a question mark already because it's not supposed to, Theore that's theoretically impossible. Yeah. Uh, and then there's there's another thing called uh, Martingale property. Yeah, you can read read up more on them. But basically, the idea here is that there are certain properties in the in time series that if they are satisfied, then auto regressive model may not be the best model for it. So do do be careful when using uh, when deciding to use auto -re auto regressive models or not. Ah, okay. Oh, even okay. Yeah, but on the question of how to set p. Uh, there's there's something called uh, ACF auto auto correlation yeah so you can use the auto correlations to tell you uh, to guide you to figuring out the value of p there should be a slide later on right? let's just continue first all right so for in auto regression you are using the past stock data to predict the future stock data right so this is somewhat intuitive there's actually another method called moving average which uses past mistakes to predict future stock price. Okay, so this one probably requires a bit of a demo. So let's say you start with today's stock price. So you know what is the price today and you want to predict tomorrow's price, right? And because you don't have enough data, your prediction for tomorrow's price is probably going to be super wrong because uh, yeah, there's, there's no way you can make a correct prediction with only today's price, right? So when day two comes, you get the actual stock price, you realize that your prediction was very off, you get an error. And this error, let's call it E, right? And then you realize, okay, since I, I've made this mistake E, I'm going to change the way I make my prediction. And I'll change the way I make my prediction according to how big this E value is. So if E is super big, then I'm probably super wrong and I need to adjust my prediction by a lot. If E is small, then I'm my prediction, the way I make my prediction is roughly correct, so I'll stick to it. So that's the intuition here. And we're going to predict the stock price on day of day three using day two's price, P2, and yeah, and a function of the error. So here is a linear function, so it's very simple. If my error is big, then I'll change uh, by, by a lot. If my error is small, I, I won't change by a lot. And then you just repeat this over and over again. So this is what we mean by using the error to predict. So you start with a random guess, and then you make the prediction using the random guess. Realize that you make a lot of mistakes, change, change the way you make your guess, and then proceed from that. And the job is to find the correct K, so find the optimum K, such that by the end of this journey, you end up with a small average error. So if your data set has 1,000 days, that means you would have uh, taken 1,000 steps of correction, right? And then by the end of these 1,000 corrections, you average out the error, you get a small number. So this is the, the, the idea of moving averages. Yeah, if, if there are any questions, just feel free to interrupt me, of course. I, I can't see y'all, so I can't see feedback. Camera is on. Yeah, so for moving average, um, the equation is given here. Um, so E E here corresponds to error, right? Um, as, as shown in the previous slide. And you, you don't have to take 
uh, the, the mistake you made from one day ago. So in the in the algorithm here, or algorithm here, you only use the mistake made one day before. So you only ever use one error value to make your prediction. But that doesn't have to be the case. You can actually make use of more than one error values. And similar idea to your um, auto regression, we call this the order also, the order of the moving average model. But instead of calling it P, we're going to call it Q because to, to differentiate it from the auto regressive case. So once again, it is conceptually a matter of linear regression because you are, the, the only difference now is that the input would be errors instead of past data values. So they are past prediction error instead of past data values. There is the difference. Um, yeah, but this definition by itself is actually very hard to implement because um, that means this model suggests that you need to have an error first in order to come up with a prediction. But then the very first time you encounter this, you you need you need to make a prediction, but then the prediction requires error. And to get error, you need to make a prediction. So it's a bit circular here. Does, does that make sense? So to come up with a prediction, you need you need to make a mistake. But then to make a mistake in the first place, you need to have made a prediction. And that makes the, the mistake, the error, what we call observable, which is you, you can't actually see the mistake. And this is why moving average models tend to not be hard coded because the the actual implementation of this is very difficult. Uh, there are libraries to do so. Yeah. Contrast to auto regressive, which you, which you can actually do it manually. You can take uh, windows or take three days and then predict, and then take another three days, predict, take another three days, predict. Yeah. But for moving average, it's actually much more um, involved in terms of implementation. Uh, mm -hmm. Sorry, you mentioned that there's a catch-22, right? That you can't make the first prediction without the error. Correct. We can't compute the error without the prediction. Then why not we just uh, randomly initialize the parameters like we said last week in the linear regression so that we can make a random prediction first to get an error? Correct, yes. So you have to do something like that. Um, so in terms of implementation detail, uh, it can be something like a simulation, right? So you throw a random prediction for the first day, see how bad it is, and then correct from there. Yeah, you're right. Lah. So in terms of the details of the implementation, that can be one way how you code the moving average model. Yeah, but then in that case, uh, getting these parameters correct will be troublesome because you have to iterate through the whole data set in the, by simulating it just to get one possible set of parameters. You don't even know if that parameter is correct or not. So in terms of optimizing the values of these parameters, that's troublesome. Does, does that make sense? So your... Uh, your then, mm -hmm. uh, how is it different than, you know, let's say linear regression? Because in linear regression, we also randomly like initialize the parameters, right? Why does it what what in MA what makes MA more difficult to optimize than linear regression? Okay, so in the in the in the auto regressive case, in the auto regressive case, right? Okay, I'm not go back a few slides. Actually, I went a bit too far. Okay, but in the in the auto regressive case, you can construct a data set before your optimization process, right? Because let's say this is your data. You can construct a data set saying I'm going to take one, two, three data point, and then the objective, the target is the fourth data point. And then I'm gonna take the two, three, four data point, objective is this data point. And then uh three, four, five data point objective is fourth data point, and so on and so forth. So although it's a time series data, but after your data processing, you end up with a table of three columns, x1, x2, x3, and the target y. And once you have this format already, you can throw in your uh, linear regression, uh, logistic regression. Like it's, it's not, it's no different than a curve fitting already once you process it. Does, does that make sense? 
Yeah, okay, thank you. Yeah. Whereas you can't do the same thing in moving average because you can curve fit on the error, but then your error depends on the fitting. So you, you have to sort of start with a random guess to get an error and then fit and then use that fit to make get a new set of errors to fit again and so on and so forth. So you you have to do more fitting. Lah. Yeah. So coding it properly and correctly is going to be troublesome. That's, that's the issue behind uh, moving average model. Um, yeah, okay, so going moving on. Um, the problem is that autoregressive and moving average models are both valid models to, to model a time series, right? You can, you can actually use both. You can use, you can use one of them, but you can actually combine the two to get an even better model, right? And this is a common technique in machine learning especially if you go for like Kaggle competitions and stuff, uh, people don't normally use just one model to get predictions. They will make one, two, five, ten models, and then they are going to use the results from all models to come up with a final, even better prediction. Right. Uh, this way of combining the results from the different models can be as simple as just averaging, or it can be something like voting. So if model A say, uh, um, 100, model B say 120, model C say 500, model C is probably wrong because it's way off. Yeah, so uh, this this kind of combining data from, or combining results from different models is quite common in the, in the field and we are going to do that and when you combine AR and MA, you get ARMA. Yes. Yeah, like they literally just add the two letters together. And ARMA have two parameters. One is P, which is the order of the AR in ARMA, and Q, which is the order in ME, which is why they separate the, the letters up. Like they, they call the order for MA, Q, and not P, so that it's, it's easier for this. All right. Um, but for the, for, the, for the ARMA models to, to work correctly, in terms, yeah, for the theory behind this fitting, right, requires time requires the data given to be stationary. And as mentioned before, you can actually derive stationary data from non-stationary data by a technique called differencing. And when you do differencing, what you're doing is basically doing a subtraction, right? So let's say B, B is your data. So B is a a non-stationary version of the data, right? So here, this this is not a very valid data because I'm I just use the Fibonacci, um, but yeah. So B is a time series data that is not stationary, and to get a different time series, so after the result of doing differencing, you just shift B some step to the right. So here I'm shifting B one step to the right. So zero becomes here, one becomes here, one becomes here, two is here, three is here, and so on and so forth. Of course, the, the first value becomes not a number because it, it has been shifted. Already. It'll be up to you to decide whether uh, not a number, do you want to throw this away or do you want to replace it with zero or with averages or whatever. But after you do the shifting, you can then subtract the non-shifted one from uh, with the shifted version. So after you do B minus A, you get, well, zero minus not a number, you can't do anything, so you get not a number also. One minus zero, you get one. One minus one, you get zero. Two minus one, you get one. Three minus two, you get one, and so on and so forth. Right. And if you do the this trick of differencing to the Tesla data, which looks like this, you will actually get something like this, which looks much, much closer to a stationary data than the original version, which is the Tesla upward trending stuff, right? And this is done with D equals to one. So D here is how many uh, time step do you shift your data? So what we did just now in this graph, uh, in this table, is actually D equals to one because you only shift B one step to the right. If you shift it five steps to the right, then D would be five. Yeah. And you achieve 
much better stationarity even when you do differencing only once right so after differencing you uh, they are actually the trend has been removed um, and they are roughly around zero and the mean looks more or less constant uh, about zero um, there are statistical analysis that can be done to check for stationarity but again we won't go into that we'll go with the intuition and say okay this is stationary enough to do our modeling is called ARIMA. So the I there stands for integrated. Yeah, um, the reason why it's called integrated is because this difference, this idea of differencing, right? Um, it, for discrete data, you're taking differences. But when your data is, a con is continuous, it is the same as taking a derivative of like differentiating the data. So because you're fitting the differentiated data, you have to integrate it to get the prediction. And that is why it's called integrated. Yeah, so you are fitting the differenced data or if you use the, the term for continuous, then it will be differentiated version. So you have to integrate it again to get the original prediction, to get the prediction for the original time series data. And you, you will integrate it D times to get the original one. Hello, Amadis. I think you're lagging a bit. Of uh, some time. yes. Uh, whoops. Okay. Uh, can can you tell me where I was? Uh, you said about like differ differencing is the same as differentiating. Is it? That's why we need to integrate. I think it's still lagging, dude. Yeah. <laughs> then you have Wi-Fi. I think you're back already. Oh, I'm back already. Okay, nice. Yeah. All right. Um, okay, where was I? Oh, differencing, right? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I so I was talking about the I here. Why is it called integrated, right? Um, the reason why is because mathematicians deal with is it internet gone again? Can can y'all can y'all hear me? Yeah, you're yeah, back again. All right, sorry about that, man. I'm on land, so yeah, I have I heard no idea some problems with Wi-Fi. Ah, uh, all right. Okay, so yeah, the, the I here is a bit of a misnomer, I guess, because in real world, your your time series data will actually be discrete, right? So it'll be like um, data one, data two, data three. So they are actually discrete data. Um, but when it, for the theory side, uh, people tend to work with the continuous version. So there are no gaps in between your data. And in the continuous version, uh, the technique of differencing is actually equivalent to differentiating. That's why they use differentiation and integration. These are the two words that they would use in, in the typical analysis of these models. And that's why the I here would actually stand for integration, even though as someone who is doing time series, you don't actually integrate anything. You're only doing sum and minuses. Yeah. 
so ARIMA model would have P, D, and Q. The P corresponds to autoregressive, Q corresponds to moving average, and the D corresponds to your difference, differencing and integrating. Um, how do we set P, D, Q? Well, you can for loop them because most of the time, P, D, and Q will actually be less than 10. Yes, they'll actually be less than 10. It's very rare for them to go beyond 10. So all you need to test is 1, 2, 3, 4, until 10. Um, that runs very fast. There are ways to avoid doing a for loop and be smarter at it. But yeah. Uh, I think you can, yeah. There are, there are like resources from that later on. All right. Now we'll go to the exotic model. So maybe this is slightly more of the fun part. Uh, so if you recall what problem problem statement two is, right? Uh, in the second way of looking at time series data, you're trying to predict XT. You're still trying to predict XT. Um, but you also consider the fact that there are background variables, there are other variables, A, that can influence your X. So the way A influence X is governed by some rule. If you know this rule, that's great. You can make use of it during your prediction. Most of the time, you don't know this rule. So we're going to call it H. So H is the rule that uh, will tell you how to get X from A. And there are some other rules that are present. So G is a function that brings you from one A to another A. F is a function from one X to another X. Yeah, so these are just like putting names on things to make it easier. Um, the problem is when A is not observable, right? So when you don't know what A actually is, like what value it takes, then um, you can either frame the problem as problem statement one, which is that you're going to just ignore the existence of A and then pretend that A doesn't exist. So you're going to make use only Xs, only the past X values to predict the future X. So this is problem statement one. Uh, you can use auto regression to do this, moving average to do this, ARMA, ARIMA to do this. Yeah. Or you can do what I think some um, the economists will do, which is to come up with an index. So the consumer sentiment index exists, and that is an index that approximates the consumer sentiment at a point in time. So the reason why it only approximates is because sentiment is not something that you can uh, you can gauge. Like you can't you can't exactly say that I am hundred units of happy or whatever, right? So you need some way of gauging uh, consumer sentiment. And that is the purpose of an index. So it's a proxy of the sentiment. Idea is that if index is high, then sentiment is probably high. If index is low, then sentiment is probably low. So yeah, you can use indices. And then instead of um, A being consumer sentiment, you can let A be the index instead. And since an index by definition have data, you can use the index to make predictions. So these are the two sort of general solution, which is basically either ignore the problem or uh, let something else be stand in for the thing that you're missing. Okay. Um, for those who are in like math or in computer science, right? Um, this, you can, you can actually sort of um, reduce this problem into a search problem, right? Because if you know, especially if you know the rule H, right? Like you know what H is specifically, and the only issue is that you don't know what is A, then you can try to find an A such that H A gives you X. And now you have uh, casted the problem into the problem of search, and then you can throw whatever technique you have learned in math or CS or uh, your other courses to do the search for A uh, properly. So one way is you can do binary search. You can binary search on A if A is like within certain values. And if A is continuous, you can do gradient descent or whatever other search techniques that you know. So that is one. Uh, but you're 
in in a sense you're sort of just shifting the problem right so now the issue is that what if h itself is unknown so not only a is unknown h is also unknown now then this technique would not work really Uh, yeah, so this is um, a bit more of an explanation on how exactly do you search. Uh, yeah, I, I don't think I'll cover this. Uh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Uh -huh. uh, how can we find H in the first place without uh, A? Yes, so that, that would be an assumption. No? Because sometimes H can be something that you can... Uh, Make yeah, up? It's, Yes, you can make up in um how to put this. Or for example, if your con if your sentiment is high, you kind of expect your stock price to be high also, right? Uh. So yeah, so the relationship is there, and you can make a model to to to, to sort of simulate this relationship. Oh, okay. Yes, okay, okay. and this is why domain knowledge is important. So if you are working on okay, in this case, maybe you want to use consumer sentiment to predict stock prices, then it will be useful to figure out how exactly does consumer sentiment affect stock price. Mm. Yeah, because if you know the fields, like the knowledge from the field of maybe econs or finance, then you would know what H is, and then that's half of the job done. Mm. Yeah, so okay. yes, this is where domain knowledge comes in. Okay, thank uh, you. Sorry, if we, yeah? if we don't have the domain knowledge, right, can we just uh, pass in all the A's and the data and the X as the objective and trade out a H. Correct, but then Would you don't work? know what is A. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you know what A is, then you can do that. So, uh, if you know A, you can find H. If you know H, you can find A. If you don't know both, you're screwed. So, if I don't know both, I need the uh, domain knowledge, is it? Uh, yeah, domain knowledge will be the fastest way to, to, to solve the problem uh, if you don't know both. Right. Uh, I guess technically speaking, you can you can do an iterative way. So you can make a generic prediction for H that is like roughly correct but not really, and then use it to make an A, and then use that values of A to make an H, and then so on and so forth. Um, but they are definitely not great and they are going to be super time consuming. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so th this slide tells the specifics on how to do the search. Um, yeah. So they are they are they are they are there for reference only. Not gonna go through them. Um, okay. For if anyone is somehow in engineering, uh, there's this I there's this idea of filtering in, in engineering, um, especially if you work with sensors like electrical and computer engineering. Um, so a particle filter, the, the way it roughly works is something like this. So because A can be anything, right? You, you're just going to guess what an A is. So you'll, you'll make, you'll, you're going to guess, let's say A is 10, that'll be your guess, right? And then you go and see X. So after guessing what A1 is, you go and check what is the value of X. And then for each uh, of the guess you make on A, you pass it to H. So if you make, let's say, 100 guesses on A, then you get 100 HAs. And then you're just going to pick off the ones that were wrong. Like if your A was 10, HA is, um, let's say, 1,000 but your x is 1, so your guess was very, very wrong, right? You're going to throw away those guesses. Yeah. And then after you throw away the wrong guesses, you keep the ones that are quite close to the correct answer. You go and make more guesses and then continue from there. So it is technically still a search, um, but it is framed as making guesses instead. So I'm going to make a guess, check my answer, uh, keep the guesses that were near the answer, throw away the guesses that were far from the answer, and then move from here. So that is the very, very rough idea behind a particle filter. Uh, 
uh, yeah, and then you just you sort of just continue doing the same thing over and over. And the idea here is that because you keep on throwing away the wrong guesses, eventually you are left with better guess. You're eventually left with the correct and yeah, the correct values of A. And because you have the correct values of A, and then you can't miss, you can't go wrong la, once you get the correct value of A once. You'll you'll keep on getting it right. So you will not get the correct values of A the first time, but as time goes on, you're you're gonna converge towards a, a more correct values of A. That is the idea here. And last but not least is probably the deep learning way of solving things. So the deep learning method, um, if as a rough guideline, deep learning and neural networks is basically what we call a universal function approximator. Not sure if you have heard of it, but the idea is that a neural network can approximate any function that you throw at it. So a neural network, one neural network can become a linear function, it can become a quadratic function, a cubic function, it can become any function that you want it to be. Right? So this solves the problem in autoregression being basically linear regression. So if you just replace your, your equation just now in the slides, which is a linear equation, with a neural network, you're removing the assumption that your data must be linear. Because your neural network can be linear, but it can also be some other thing. Yeah. And one way you can do this is that, like as I mentioned just now, you can you can just sample your data. So you take data at time one, time two, time three, and then use the time four as the target. And then time two, time three, time four, use time five as the target. And then in this way, you construct a data set you divide the data set into training data, validation data, testing data. Um, yeah, you probably encounter this in your uh, form already. And then you train no, using your training data, test on validation, or, or rather verify on validation. And then after iterating between train and validation, you go to the test data. Um, yeah, so extending it to neural networks is sort of trivial because it's a matter of replacing one equation with another equation. Uh, the concern is how do you split train validation test for a time series? Uh, normally, what people would say is to just randomly take your data, put into train, put into validation, put into test, right? But that cannot be used for time series. So for time series, we are strict and we say that if train is within this segment, Validation must be in a separate segment and tests must be in a separate segment. So there cannot be any overlap between your train validation and test. So you cannot, for example, take train to be, I take one data here, put into train, I take another data from far off, put into train, and then I take somewhere in between, put into test, right? Because one, that doesn't simulate reality. In reality, you won't be predicting uh, data between two days ago and today, right? That, that's not how, that's not useful. And secondly, modeling, uh, neural networks and actually any kind of model is very good at interpolating. They are good at connecting dots in your data set. So if your data is like, let's say somewhere far off to the left, and then another data point is somewhere far off to the right, it'll probably get everything in between correct. But the whole point is not to get everything in between correct. The whole point is to extrapolate it into data points that are beyond the bounds that you have set. So that, that is why the validation, the bounds for validation, so the, the timing for validation uh, is different from the timing from train. Yes, uh, that, is, that is the different approach. So actually the deep learning approach of solving is actually super popular today. Um, these two approaches, um, the particle filter and the, and the search is, they are there, but very rare. I, I think I only saw one filtering approach for time series recently. Yeah, because I mean, deep learning is all the rage these days. Um, but the reason I've included them is only for 
uh, for some people to maybe be able to relate to the uh, models better, to the method better. Yeah. Right, and that's essentially the end. So the, this is a brief summary on what we have covered. So we did, we talked about uh, time series data, the basics of time series, and what exactly is the problem that we are trying to solve, and then some of the possible approach to model time series data. More specifically, we've talked about autoregressive models and moving average models, which are basically just linear regression. The only difference is what they take in as an input. Autoregressive takes in past data as input. Moving average takes in past errors as input. And then we have uh, ARIMA and ARMA, which is when you combine uh, autoregressive and moving average together. And we also very briefly cover uh, some other different approaches to model time series data. All right, what well, now? Um, as you can see, we sort of skipped a lot of the theory and like heavy parts of things. So we skipped about um, feature selection, feature engineering, feature processing. We skipped Markov property, the Martingale property. I mean, they are there in the slides, but um, yeah, we didn't we didn't discuss them in depth. Also, how to get P, D, and Q, the orders of your model. Uh, in the slides, we just said using for loops, right? There's actually a correct an approach called ACF, autocorrelation factor and partial autocorrelation, PACF. And using this, they'll sort of give a guidance to your P, D, and Q. Um, but honestly, reading AC, reading the results of ACF and PACF, while in theory it looks very nice, in practice it um, they are not super helpful, I would say. Like, you look if you if you have data and then you pass it through the ACF, right? It doesn't. Okay, let's let's put it this way. If ACF tells you that p equals to two point five, you still have to either decide to use p equals to two or p equals to three, because your p has to be an integer. But ACF doesn't know that. Yeah. So the 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 results from your from this approach. ACF and PACF can be ambiguous to interpret. So depending on the scale of the problem, it may just be easier to use a for loop and not bother with trying to interpret the results of this approach. And using neural networks is another thing. You can replace the equations in linear regression, uh, in autoregressive and moving average model with a neural network and you can do the optimization using libraries lah, like TensorFlow, PyTorch, etc. Um, yeah, the details of this will be skipped also. And these are some resources uh, to learn more, to, to read up more about what we have discussed. So these resources actually focus more on the programming aspect, right? So the ACF and PACF is here. Uh, yeah, you don't quite need to know the details lah, as, as long as you know how to um, call functions and stuff, that's fine. Arima, again, so after what you have learned today uh, behind the scene about how Arima works, um, this is the actual coding aspect. You can take a look at it. And then we have time series forecasting as supervised learning. So this is trying to use uh, the deep learning approach to do time series prediction. And yeah, that is all for today. Um, it's a very fast presentation. Oh. Um, yeah, anyone have any questions? I'll be sending the slides out, so no worries about it. For the M M A method, right? The yes. one based on past mistake. Why yes. do we introduce a K? Ah, okay. So the K is. Okay. Uh, let me just go back to the slides. Because uh, you don't know exactly how does the error predict. Um, how does the error help you, right? You know they are correlated in some way, but you don't know how do you. Uh, use error 
to to make your prediction right so the k is a way for you to make that prediction it's a very simple uh, way you are just saying that if i have an error e then i'm going to change it by ke you can change it by e squared that's possible that that would be a different model altogether you can change it by ke plus a constant that would be a slightly different model also but uh, that, that was for illustration purposes as in what why not just take k equals to one all the time like why oh. do we need a constant before that uh, okay so k is not a constant k is actually a parameter in the model so k is the thing that you want to find such that you get a good model oh does that make sense somewhat yeah okay uh, okay okay yeah so I'll attempt to share again so you know how in the in the auto regressive version you, you have something like this right Mm. So you have the pass values, and then the thetas here are parameters that you want to to adjust mm. such that you get a good prediction. Yes. Yes. K serves the exact same uh, reason for moving average. Uh, okay, yeah. Here I wrote it a bit better. So it's theta 1, theta 2, theta 3 also. So how do you, uh, how do you scale the, the errors such that you get a good prediction? Mm. Yeah, so K was actually theta here. La. It probably should have been consistent. Okay, okay. Can, can, can. Yeah. Ah, thank you. Yeah. You say it's not recorded, but you say someone is recording this. Uh, yeah, I think, I think someone started yeah. recording or something yeah I, I think i'm recording because like when you said you cannot record so i just like try 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 oh what a freak okay nice thanks <laughs> okay right yeah I, for some reason there are no record button on my teams not know why teams sucks thanks amadeus yeah And yes, um, there there's a project, there's a project one coming up. Ah, I forgot to release the project. Okay, uh, the link is here. It's a Kaggle, it's a Kaggle project. So I'm just going to send in the group, in the, in the Telegram group. So do click on the link and join the join the competition. So, uh, the the task here, right, I can just open the Kaggle. Yeah, okay, so this is your project one. Screen. Yes. Okay, so this is your, your first project which you will do um, individually. Uh, but basically, it's a stock price prediction problem. Lah. And yeah, so the data has already been given under data. And the data is like, yeah, it's basically an Excel sheet lah, of sorts. Yeah, so do use pandas. To, to process the data if you want to and then the data is consists of open high low and close and volume right so but all the all these data uh, open high low and volume is irrelevant what you care about is actually the close because close corresponds to closing price and yeah the job is to predict the stock price from 2018 to 2020. Yeah. So the entire data set actually consists of 2010 to 2021, but the ones that you have access to is not until 2021. It stops at I think 2017 or early 2018. Yeah. So you are you are supposed to use data from 2010 to 2017 to make predictions for the 2018 to 2020 and yeah can just take a look uh, just keep in mind that apart from the submission to Kaggle so you can actually if you join competition you can make submissions to the leaderboard then you can see how you fare against other people in, in, the, in, the, in the workshop um, apart from making the submission we will also require you to submit a Jupyter notebook 
So the Jupyter Notebook, highly likely you make your submission using Jupyter Notebook instead of uh, standard Python script. Lah. So we want you to submit a Jupyter Notebook also. And this notebook, as per usual, should be annotated, right? So it shouldn't just be full of code. There should be explanations going on as to why you do certain things. And uh, we would want to encourage you to showcase you using three different models. So try to use maybe model A, yeah, maybe autoregressive, moving average, and then ARMA. Yeah, just to get, yeah, so that you know like the limitations and the strengths of the different models and the different approaches. And also, how do you come up with the final model? So this, um, this is only if you decide to combine results from the three models, right? So maybe you pick a deep learning approach and then you pick an ARIMA approach. And then for the final submission to Kaggle, you decide to average the values from your uh, deep learning approach and the ARIMA approach. Then, yeah, please do, please do tell us that you, you take an average and not just, you know, otherwise we run your script and then we realize how come your output is different from the one you submitted and that'll be a bit strange. Uh, yeah, so that is all for, for it. The project is due in 19 days, so that's more than two weeks. You can, you have yeah, the entire recess week. You can also discuss with people, actually. That, that is completely fine. As long as you don't copy paste code, that is more or less okay. Uh, the rules are here. Don't tell us if you cannot join or if there are any issues with joining. And yeah, all right. Um, are there any more questions? Maybe about the competition, uh, about the Kaggle. It's not exactly a competition. Maybe about the Kaggle or about the, the things we covered today. You're, you're, yeah, you're, you're free to go like, if you have no questions. Like. So, yeah. Maybe we, are, we are done basically. And thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye. See someone asked in the chat. Oh, uh, is the test set 2018 to 2021 data? Yes, but you don't exactly need to care too much about it because, um, yeah, it's, it's actually already in the, in the sample submission. So in the sa sample submission, there's a column called ID, which actually corresponds to the test, uh, to the dates of the test set. Yeah, so if you do need the time, then you can use that to make predictions. Yeah, you can straight away predict using those values and then replace the, the predicted column with your prediction. Yeah. Right. Leaderboard scores with the predictions on those years, right? Yes and no, because there's a public leaderboard and a private leaderboard, right? So the ones that you see, which is the public leaderboard, would be a subset of 2018 to 2021. And then the private leaderboard will be a different subset. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? No? Alright, if not then I'll, I'll just end the meeting. Thanks for coming.